Well, uh, we're very thankful today to be joined by uh, Dr. Bruce Hollis uh, from the Medical University of South Carolina, Professor Emeritus, an esteemed uh, researcher, clinician, uh, very, very well published uh, and cited in many facets of vitamin D. So a perfect guest for our uh, Vitamin D and Me podcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Hollis, for joining us today. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, yeah, I was... Uh, directed research, primarily pregnancy, uh, for my work that carried me through most of my career. Did a lot of collaboration on vitamin D and cancer and epidemiologic studies with Harvard. Um, the physicians and nurses health study up there that really continue on to this day. So, um, I mean, that resulted in, in a lot of publications of, uh, of vitamin D in relation to a lot of other uh, diseases outside of our work in pediatrics. Wonderful. With that, um, because it covered so many areas, tell us a bit about some of the testing you developed, uh, uh, really a support of your experiments, but how that became uh, so integral to the body of evidence out there today in vitamin D. We uh, determined vitamin D content in milk and a lot of technical procedures, and ultimately we simplified these procedures, uh, especially to measure um, 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the uh, the compound that when you go to the physician, it's the one they're going to measure. It's the one that gives you vitamin D status. If you go back into the 80s, it was never measured. Occasionally, it would be done for because it was always associated with bone disease. So, but it wasn't. It was rarely measured in a clinical setting. And as time went on through the 90s, and especially beginning of the, of the new millennia, the vitamin D testing exploded. And it became one of the biggest run medical tests in, in the world. And uh, you, we, de- you know, my partner and I, we developed really the first commercialized test that's, that runs on, uh, uh, on these automated machines. Um, we worked with a company called Diasor Corporation. And uh, we had an ongoing collaboration with them for almost 30 years. You know, wow. so I was actually I was working a job, you know, consulting in industry for these guys, and I was doing my academic job. So it involved a, an incredible amount of traveling all around the world for 15 years. I'm done with all that. I don't do that anymore. But uh, you know, it was very rewarding to do this to, and, and to see those tests now progress to where they are now. So they're they're automated. They're on these automated uh, platforms where you just load a blood sample into a cassette and press a button, and out comes a number. So it's uh, progressed a lot from, you know, 40 years ago when we were doing the very basics at Guelph. No, absolutely. From that perspective, in terms of getting uh, the testing in place, what were some of sort of the initial findings once you had this tool that you and your team developed? What were some of the initial findings that really excited you in the sort of early years and the pioneering years of, uh, of vitamin D research where you felt that, hey, this is a trajectory for me research-wise, clinician-wise, career-wise, that I, I want to use this as a building block going forward? Uh, one of the things is, you know, when I, in my graduate training, with respect to human milk, uh, human milk was supposed to be the perfect food for, for the human neonate, except one thing, rickets, if, they, if that was their only source of food. And that really made no sense to me at all. How could that be possible? And uh, so we it hadn't been done. We wanted to define what content of human milk was. And it was much lower than it is in blood. And uh, we eventually discovered that it was about 50 international units per day, not enough to really support the nursing and, uh, and, so, and sometimes a lot lower if you were a person of color. And mm-hmm. one of the to re- regress a little bit, back in those days when you ran uh, samples, the African-Americans were always half or less of the circulating amount of vitamin D. And back in those days, they thought, well, this I guess this is normal, you know, never thinking that it was detrimental to health, that, that it was okay for people of color to be half or less of the levels that were in white people, Caucasians, which also wasn't enough for even for them. So, uh, you know, as time went on and, and we began to understand this more of, uh, and, and even now, I think the underlying problem, this has to do with the, the terrible vitamin D status of, of people of color. So, you know, and the, and the testing 
a lot of the stuff we were doing with Harvard was uh, in retrospective studies, looking at the relationship of vitamin D and cancer and multiple sclerosis and and all these things from their physicians, you know, their their health professional studies that they have the blood bank up there with literally millions of blood samples. And then they decide what study, what a relationship we're going to hold. And I did, I probably did 50 studies measuring compounds for those guys over the couple of decades. Wow. And it resulted in a lot of publication. So those observational data, randomized controlled trials, you know, in my view, on randomized controlled trials and vitamin D is they're a waste of time. You can't do a randomized controlled trial on a natural substance when you have no control over what the initial levels are. Everybody starts with something. There's always a background level, right? Yeah. yeah so it's not like a drug. I mean, you are got it or you don't you have it, you know. With vitamin D, everybody's got something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of these trials would go on where they would uh, – Everybody would get thrown into a group and with, and again, without even measuring baseline levels in, in people, give them some amount. There are so many other issues with running randomized control trials with vitamin D. So when it comes to maternal transfer of vitamin D, I know you're a you're well-known expert in the field. Is there, is there a general guide, given people have varying background levels, but is there a general guide to... Uh, the lactating mom, how much she needs to take for the maternal transfer, but also to ensure her own levels are uh, in an optimal so here's range. So here's, here's a funny thing about, you know, something that we looked at. So in the blood, okay, 25-hydroxy vitamin D is the form that's normally measured. It's the major circulating form, okay? Mm -hmm. That's not, not the form that passes into human milk. The form of human milk is vitamin D itself. So... Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can you can women can have quite high 25 hydroxy levels and have very little vitamin D in their milk. You know, you go back, it, it gets technical. The half life of compounds, half life of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is two to three weeks in the blood. Half life of vitamin D is about a day. All right, which means if you want to sustain, sus, you know, sustain levels even in the circulation, you need to take it every day. In our studies, we need about 6,000 units a day to pass enough vitamin D into her milk to supply the nursing infant with, say, 600 IUs per day uh, per liter of milk, and it did the job nicely. So the answer to your question is, you know, lactating women need to take 6,000 units sometimes more, but, but that's no, you know, my recommendation is that everybody takes that, not just pregnant women or lactating women, everybody take it. So I'm not singling that out, but in, in those particular situations, it's really, it's really key. And in pregnancy, you know, we, our studies showed that vitamin D could actually decrease the rates of birth complications. I don't know if you know this, but when you, you know, there's always this fighting about claims on label claims on whatever vitamins by the FDA, what the FDA allows you to say. You can't, put on a vitamin um, supplement, a vitamin D supplement, this will cure cancer or this will prevent cancer. They, they won't allow it. You'll get, you know, squashed, you know, you'll get a letter real fast. That's so, right. okay. So a couple of years ago, the FDA saw enough work, uh, uh, validity in our work to actually put on the label that vitamin D can aid in the prevention of complications of birth. So wow. that was a, so that's that a big breakthrough. <laughs> that was a big breakthrough that the FDA, because before that it was it was all bone, well provide you know aid in, in skeletal you know homeostasis, bone formation, which it always has been, and and basically would not allow you to say one other thing about vitamin D, all these other things that were indirect. But but a couple of years ago they backed down and they said. We'll let you say that from this data that it will likely prevent complications of birth. Now they what they didn't say they didn't give a recommendation of what the what you should take a day. And actually that was quite a smart move because what they basically said was it's between you and your you and your physician and you should be monitored. Okay, which is, you know occasionally you should be. So take enough to get the level where you want it to be. And our, and our, our level that we always targeted was about 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. And to get the population as a whole to that level, you need between four and 6,000 units a day. 
in a normal person to keep those levels at, you know, the 25 hydroxy levels at those uh, desired levels. And, and also I say we're at loggerheads with the regulatory, not FDA, well, per se, but, you know, the official government recommendation is only 800 units a day for everybody, you know, and, and that is, you know, I think it's ridiculous and, and doesn't really do anything. And, and I've always asked the question, how, how is it that a newborn infant has a requirement of 400 units a day and somebody who weighs 300 pounds has a requirement of 400 units a day? You know, nobody would, nobody would answer that question. It, it doesn't make any sense. Right. And, and it doesn't make any sense, okay? Yeah. So if you give an infant 400 units a day, a newborn, they're going to have really good blood levels. You give a, you know, a 300 pound or 400 units a day, you'll see nothing. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, you know, it's always been a quandary to me. I, I don't really pay attention to the recommendations because they don't, they don't, they don't mean anything to me. Well, and often the recommendations, uh, both in the U.S. and in Canada, amongst other jurisdictions, are anywhere from 10 to 15 to sometimes even 20 years behind where the science is actually at. They're often well, here, very slow to here, catch. Here's, here's the problem. They want randomized controlled trials to make claims. It's never going to happen. Okay. Mm. Our randomized controlled trial in pregnancy and lactation needs for about three to four million dollars. Okay. Funded by the government. They were only a thousand patients. You know, they, they want randomized controlled trials of, you know, 20,000. I mean, it's not happening. Nobody's going to fork over hundreds of millions of dollars to do this. And so my argument was, look at the data we have, make recommendations on that. Nobody, I, in all the studies that we've done for years, okay, I mean, and we have never seen one adverse event due to vitamin D supplementation, not one. Within your studies, yeah. Within our study and, and other studies. I've been on data and safety monitoring boards for other people's studies, and, and we've never seen, a, you know, a, a adverse event on vitamin D intakes up to 10,000 units a day. Hmm. And that's a lot of uh, study participants when you that's st thousands, stack them up. Yeah. Thousands of, of participants. And, and so it's like, well, yeah, there might be a problem, but we're waiting for the first problem to show up. <laughs> you know, it's dangerous, but we're still waiting for it. We want to, you know, we want to see that one patient mm -hmm. and it hasn't shown itself yet. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's ludicrous the way that they do this. Now, with, with all the publications you had over 300, what are some of the real key ones in your mind that you say, yeah, the, out of all the ones I've been involved with, these are my top, you know, two or three beyond the, uh, Pregnancy lactation story. We touched on that a bit, but in other so you, populations, you know, those are you know, you can go to you can go to to Google a scholar and search out whoever you want, and they'll list the publications and they'll show you the number of times those publications have been cited. Okay, yes. yeah. And so, number one on my list was a collaborative study that I was lucky enough to be in with Robert Modlin's group at UCLA on how vitamin D was a controller of innate immune function. It was published in science. It's been cited almost going on 4,000 citations. Wow. So that was, that was an incredible piece of science. You know, it mm -hmm. was showed that vitamin D truly is a, a, a master controller of our immune system. You know, both the innate immune system and the adaptive system. The adaptive system means generation of antibodies and, an innate immune system means it's a primitive immune system that animals without skeletons have. They don't have bone marrow, so they can't make antibodies. So an insect or a shark or, you know, they only have the innate system where they have these uh, uh, toll receptors that uh, attack bacteria and viruses. They, they can't make antibodies. And mammals have both systems. So, and vitamin D has a lot of control of both uh, in the innate and the adaptive system. So, it has roles in autoimmune function and multiple sclerosis generation, you know, and, and, but the one thing I would always say is don't, you know, don't cut your physician out of the loop, you know, tell him what you're doing, uh, monitor it, you know, see how it's going, and, but it works. I mean, if you have low level prostate cancer and you take vitamin D largely, it, it, it can keep it in check for a long time. And drag it out at least at the very least. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I often told people, imagine if that was a drug developed by Pfizer, okay, and you had 70% regression in active surveillance. That would be all over the news. It would be a multi-billion dollar drug. 
Yeah, for vitamin D, it's free. And it's hardly, it's and unless you look at the, you know, the, the YouTubes and stuff, it, you would never know that. Yeah. No, very interesting insight on that for sure. What is, what is your view on vitamin D as it relates to COVID and no. in, in the general population and specific populations? Um, so my point on vitamin D and COVID is, I don't think it will prevent you from getting COVID. I think it'll prevent you from getting it badly. Okay. 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 And why would that um, be? Or why, how does that, you know, in basic terms, how does that work? Well, you, you know, vi vitamin D keeps your immune system in tune. So uh, it keeps the uh, innate immune system. So the initial response when a virus enters your body is the innate immune system goes after it, recognizes it. That portion of the, that portion of the uh, system is dependent, vitamin D dependent. And then alteration of uh, T helper cells by vitamin D that communicate with the B cells to make antibodies is also a key function of vitamin D. But one of the other things I think the, probably the biggest thing is the effect of vitamin D on, on um, um, cytokine storm and hyper, hyperimmune.